Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Buck. Our final speaker um, is another distinguished neuroscience scientist who served on the Gruber Neuroscience Advisory Board for the first two years of the prize. Dr. Fred Gage is a professor in the Laboratory of Genetics at the Salk Institute. His work concentrates on the adult central nervous system and unexpected plasticity and adaptability to environmental stimulations that remains throughout the life of all mammals. His studies also focus on the cellular, molecular, and environmental influences that regulate neurogenesis in the adult. Prior to joining Salk in 1995, Dr. Gage was a professor of neuroscience at the University of California, San Diego. He received his PhD from Johns Hopkins University and has won numerous prizes and awards for his work, including the Ibsen Prize for Neuroplasticity, the Charles A. Dana Award, the Metropolitan Life Research Award, and the KO Medical Science Prize. He is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and a member of the National Academy of Sciences. He's also a former president of the Society for Neuroscience and is president-elect of the International Society for Stem Cell Research. Please welcome Dr. Fred Gage. Thank you, Mary. I want to extend my congratulations and warm wishes to Peter. And thanks to Peter and, and uh, Patricia for their support of sciences, uh, or excellence in sciences, and their encouragement of both senior scientists as well as junior scientists. It's a great pleasure that you've chosen our fields to support. I'm going to talk uh, about my interests uh, in brain plasticity. In particular, I'll, I'll focus on this area of adult neurogenesis just briefly. But I thought I would um, then talk a little bit about serendipity and how uh, when studying some areas of research, uh, you find other things and you sometimes follow that path. And, I'll tell you about our, our diversion from uh, adult neurogenesis into this other area that has led us into this concept of, of neurodiversity. So the nervous system is obviously uh, very complex as you've been hearing, and uh, numbers are thrown around uh, of 100 billion neurons, 100 trillion connections between these neurons and, and the adult nervous system. And the complexity is not just neurons, but there are glial cells and vasculature interactions between cells. So you can imagine uh, the complexity of thinking that must be involved in considering the idea that a new neuron would somehow integrate into this system. And certainly, um, when this concept by Joe Altman was proposed some 40 years ago now, that new neurons were being generated in the nervous system, it generated a significant amount of skepticism. Over the last years, Folks here at Rockefeller like Fernando Maltebaum and, and Songbirds and, uh, and Bruce McHugh and Matt have, along with many others, have uh, added evidence supporting the fact that this phenomenon occurs. It really occurs now, we know, in, in the mammalian system in two areas. One is in the olfaction, in the olfactory system that you just heard about, where there are primitive cells that are born in the ventricular system and they migrate out to the olfactory bulb. Some of them stay in the glomerular, uh, in the granular cell layer. Others pass through this tufted mitral area to, to land up in the glomerular system. Uh, it's not clear exactly what they're doing in that area, but perhaps participating in, in the acquisition and recognition of differences between orders. The other area where this occurs, the area I'll focus on briefly, and this is in the, in the hippocampus. The hippocampus is a structure in the brain that's involved uh, in the acquisition of new memories. And the, one of the ex last recipients of the Google Prize, John O'Keefe, is here, who was awarded for his work in, particularly in CA1. It's a unique structure because it receives uh, information from all the cortical areas, or it passes through what we call the trisynaptic circuit, and somehow memories of events, taking in the olfaction and emotion and timing of the events are clustered into a separate memory where the information is then stored out into the cortex where it can be recalled again as a clustered memory. Well, in this first relay structure, there's memory called the dente gyrus, and this is where the new neurons are being born in the adult nervous system. And I'll tell you a little bit about it, give you a little bit of update on that. <clears throat> 
There are these new cells do exist now. We found in all, all mammals, from mouse to human, and they exist in the same area, and they have very much the same markers. The variety of ways you can look at this. Uh, this is in an adult mouse, uh, pulsed with bromidioxyurine, which incorporates them to dividing cells. So all of the, this animal was pulsed two months earlier as an adult, so all of these dark cells correspond to new neurons that were born and have survived and incorporated into the dentate gyrus. It's a good way to quantify the cells, but it doesn't give you very much of the morphology. We introduced the technology using retroviruses some years ago, uh, which allow for the in introduction of the virus into the dividing cell and then expresses permanently. In this way, you get nice morphological uh, evidence for it. And you can end up seeing and uh, documenting how these cells change their morphology and how they develop in, and integrate into the adult nervous system. So it takes a good month for the newly born cells to take on morphology. Sometimes wondered how a small number of cells integrating the dentate could have an impact, but here you can see a single injection of a retrovirus into the dentate gyrus, uh, which lasts about an hour and a half to two hours before the virus is degraded. So all of these cells were born in the adult brain over that short period of time. These are their dendritic processes, and these correspond to their axons, but innovate into the CA3. So even though there's only a few cells being born at any one time, their impact can be rather large. What's always been remarkable to me, though, is that it's not that the cells are being just born, but they're receiving appropriate input, that they're sending their axons out into the appropriate pathways and integrating into a, a circuitry. And that's what we spent a fair amount the last number of years documenting with some uh, clarity. So now we know that these newly born cells, in fact, do integrate into the circuit, and they do make synaptic contacts with their targets. In fact, we know that uh, as they go into the circuitry, they don't make new circuits. They don't actually uh, draw new synapses out. But the current uh, view of this is that the newly born cells send out philopodia from their dendrites, and they compete with existing synapses. So here you see the a young stage, this is a little bit older, where there's a sharing of a postsynaptic density with the uh, newly born uh, spine, and then over time, it, uh, it takes over by itself. So we think that the remodeling that occurs and the way that these integrate is through a, a competitive mechanism. The timing of this is, uh, is rather, uh, rather remarkable. So in the adult, uh, it's very consistent across all, all mammals that we know of now where they're being born in the first week. They have a, a remarkable physiology where they, um, receive, they, they receive a GABAergic or inhibitory input very early on in the development, but the inhibitory input um, or the GABA input is actually excitatory. So they're excited by their inhibitory input at an early stage, but this changes once the excitatory input from the neuronal uh, tissue comes in. All, and, and their spines are coming in around three weeks of age, and they fully mature by six. But what's important is that there's a, there appears to be a critical period of time uh, when they're about two to three weeks old where they're hyper-excitable. And we can measure this excitability um, a variety of ways. We can use different colors to label the cells at different stages during birth. So these cells were, were labeled early on in birth in the animal, and then at a later time point we came in and labeled these second cells which allow you then to take, this, take uh, the animals at different stages and um, within the same animal patch, clamp, electrophysiologically record from two animals or two cells within the same animal and look at their uh, function, their physiology, how they differ depending upon when they were born and how they integrate into the circuitry. The important feature is that they do integrate and they're quite similar both in terms of their uh, normal physiology and in response to external stimulation. One thing does re remain consistent throughout life as these cells are coming in, and that is that they, they have this critical period of excitability. And more recent work has been done uh, looking at this more carefully with regard to the properties, the physiological and anatomical properties of the cells, and have been uh, computational modeling has, has revealed that there may be a, that there is in fact a critical period, and this has been now tested experimentally demonstrating that these young cells are playing an important role in spatial temporal pattern separation function of the dentate gyrus. Another that uh, is getting a lot more attention right now. <clears throat>
So the final piece of this is that, that uh, this process of neurogenesis is not stagnant. It's, it's uh, highly regulated. So genetic strain differences are, are dramatic. And stress and aging affect this as well as environment and exercise can all impact the rate, uh, at the rate in survival of the cells. So in order to understand this whole process of how the environment can influence uh, the, this process at a molecular level so we can manipulate it in some way, one of the advantages of the system is that we can isolate from the adult brain purified populations of these stem cells. So we've developed over the years methods for using, uh, initially using concentration gradients, but ultimately by tagging and cloning the cells and uh, by fact sorting. But individual cells can be isolated directly from the adult nervous system and then they can be propagated indefinitely in culture. So for example, here's a single cell uh, played under conditions which we know are optimal for maintaining the cells in a proliferative state. And part of our, our challenge now is to understand the molecular mechanisms that allow the cell to self-renew and then to make a choice to differentiate into another cell. So in this case, you can see that uh, the cells are uh, dividing at about every 18 hours. And there's an, there is an internal clock to these cells such that uh, they'll, co they'll continue to divide. So now two goes into uh, four, and the four cells now will divide into eight. Come on. <laughs> so I've seen this before, so I know that there's, it's going to divide. So they'll continue to divide until they reach confluency, and then they'll make cell-cell contact with each other, and then they begin to differentiate. And part of what we really know is what all these intrinsic signals and what are the uh, secretive signals that play a role in this. And the way we do this is to purify the cells into populations and then induce differentiation down the major lineages in the nervous system, which are neurons, all of the dendrocytes and astrocytes. And beginning to understand both the external signals and the internal transcriptional machinery that's important for this. And this is where the story uh, takes a turn. And I'll tell you a little bit about serendipity. So one of the postdocs in the lab was uh, doing this experiment of uh, purifying the cells. And we um, found that a factor called CCG, which is secreted from the cells in an autocrine way, that maintains the cells in a very homogeneous population. Well, for gene array technology, it's, it's very important that you have um, homogeneous populations. So Vichy developed this um, isolated and purified the protein, added it with FGF2, and we, we got this purified pro population of cells that had just committed to become neurons. So we thought we really had a good way of comparing that state to being an astrocyte, being an oligodendrocyte, being a purified neuron, and being a, a stem cell. So she did an array, as you heard from Dr. Botstein's early technology we were using, and found, um, to much to her chagrin, that the first nine genes with the highest level of expression in this purified population were all elements ca called line elements, and most of them the open leading frame of um, O2 of the, of the line elements. Uh, she was so depressed by this that she uh, left the lab and went off and worked in industry with the idea that this is not what she wants to do. Line elements are, in fact, what we've called in the past junk DNA. And uh, their, their general strategy is that they are redundantly uh, expressed throughout the central nervous system. And in one form of these jumping genes are transposons that genomically can copy and paste their own DNA and move mobily to other areas of the, of the genome. This was uh, work that was elucidated in, in, to clarity by Barbara McClintock um, during her period of time at Cold Spring Harbor. Now, people have thought about these mobile elements as being um, drivers of evolution and adding to the diversity that might exist in the genome. And when you look at the genome for these line elements in the human genome, um, there are different types of mobile elements. So greater than 50% of the genome is made up of sequence, which is uh, either still active or more likely than not uh, dormant DNA sequences. And the ones that we're particularly interested in are the line elements, and they constitute about 17% of the entire, code, the entire uh, sequence of the human genome. 
These are all elements. So what are they and, and how do they function? Well, these sequences exist in the, in the genome in, in such a way as a stretch of DNA that has a promoter and two open reading frames. They uh, make a piece of RNA which is transported outside the machinery. They, 50 percent of the RNA is translated into proteins, these ORF1 and ORF2 proteins, one of which is a RNA binding protein, the other two correspond to reverse transcriptase and an endonuclease. In a cell that's dividing, the nuclear membrane is open, and this complex can be transported back into the DNA. Where the endonuclease has a specific site it recognizes in the DNA where it cuts and then the reverse transcriptase uh, reverses the RNA into DNA and it inserts itself into the DNA. So this is a retrotransposon copy and paste method. So just to remind you, these transcripts were being made in high abundance when our cells are differentiating into neurons. So if the transcripts are made, is it possible that there's actually insertions that are happening inside our cells during this period of time? Well, one of the ways we can mark this is to make an artificial, take a, take a line element, an existing one, take the sequence, and insert into the three prime uh, end of it a reporter construct, which has a GFP molecule, which will light the cell up green, but put an intron into it, so that when it's transcribed, the splice acceptor and splice donor site exclude the intron, they paste back together, and when the DNA is reversed, is inserted into the, D, into the new site in the DNA, you have a green cell. So it's a way of detecting where an insertion of it is occurring. We use this, trans, this, uh, this uh, method to look at our neural stem cells, and sure enough, we found that in these stem cells, we found insertions occurring only in neural progenitor cells, but not in any other cell types that we looked at. So we looked at mesenchymal stem cells, fibroblasts, even astrocytes of the brain, but didn't see them. Using the same construct, we decided to see if this event would actually occur in vivo instead of just whether or not this was an artifact of, of an in vitro situation. So we made a transgenic animal that had this same construct. And to our surprise, we found in these animals green cells all over the place and when we do laser capture for single cells, we can see that the cells are not only transgenic, but they have insertions of these uh, elements into their neurons and not into other cells again. And there were no other green cells that we saw. Occasionally, we did see um, cells in, in, um, in testes and in, in, uh, ovaries, but that, that's another story that we can talk about. So where in the genome do they land? So it, what you can do is once they go in, you can use primers and do inverse PCR, and you can identify where in the genome these uh, genes are doing. It's not a very efficient way. It's very time consuming. But we did this with about 50, and now, initially about 50, and now about 150 different gene inserts. Many of them are inserted, at least in our neural progenitor cells, in the proximity of neurons. Um, and we looked at uh, one of these in particular, which was PSD93, or postsynaptic density 93. So we had one of our insertions into the promoting region of this, of this gene called PSD93. And the advantage with this is that we can clone these cells because they're green. We can take them as individual cells, grow them up, and do the inverse PCR, identify the insert, and then characterize and work with these cells to see what the impact of this would be. And what we found in this single clone uh, was that it increased the expression of PSD93 and also uh, protein expression. And when we looked at the behavior of that clone relative to the parent clone, these cells would more readily turn into neurons. So it, it looked as possibly that the insertion was actually having a functional effect, at least on this clone. And when we knocked out the, the PSD, uh, excuse me, when we overexpress PSD normally in, in these wild type cells, we got something of a similar phenotype, and then we knocked out the PSD93, or knocked it down anyway in the clone that was overexpressing it, we reversed the phenotype, suggesting that a single insertion into the promoter region could in fact have an effect. So we want to know a little bit about how these are regulated. And we haven't talked about this very much at this uh, small symposium, but gene regulation uh, has a variety of ways in which it's, it's regulated. One by its promoter sequences, uh, where proteins can bind and regulate uh, them, but also by uh, events, uh, epigenetic me mechanisms, 
It's called methylation. And there are these uh, methylation sites of, of high interest or uh, promoter of, of a lot of protein of, of interest for us called SOX2. So SOX2 is bound to the uh, line 1 promoter and surrounded by CPG ions. And both of them, in fact, bind uh, to the promoter, to the line 1 promoter, and they seem to be regulating it so that if you uh, knock down, uh, take a promoter reporter of the uh, line sequence and knock out any CP2, you get a massive increase in the line activity, and overexpressing SOX2 can suppress it. We want more than we need as I'm sort of re calibrating to this audience, I'll, I'll, I'll just say that uh, there is a coordination that exists between SOX2 and MECP2 uh, such that uh, SOX2 also binds uh, directly to MECP2 and, and MECP2 has a separate function where it binds the DNA. Uh, so it's just a, a, a little bit of an elaboration on, on this, this complex which, which we've been studying with some detail. So MECP2, if MECP2 in culture is suppressing it, is it possible that this event that we're looking at, this, this gene mobility uh, in the brain, is modulated, in fact, by these deletions? So we took a mouse that is missing MECP2 and crossed it with our reporter mouse, and much to our surprise, we saw a massive increase in the numbers of insertions that occur not everywhere in the brain, but in certain regions. So this was work that Carol Marchetto did where she went back and actually counted the number of, of inserted cells or green cells and, and showed, the green light just went, that there's a, uh, in certain regions like hippocampus and in the cerebellum and the olfactory bulb, there was a massive increase in the number of, of uh, events. So what I've told you about so far is mostly these reporter constructs. We've been trying to think of ways to actually measure more endogenous amounts uh, of, of events that are occurring. And in this sense, uh, because we're only looking at one, one reporter, when in the mouse there's 3,000 active elements, and in the human there's uh, many active elements that are there. So uh, the, the theory is that if in fact there, there are insertions that are occurring in the brain, um, then the total amount of DNA content should be more within neurons than in other tissue of that same animal. So we are, would in fact be a mosaic in our brains relative to other organs. And if it further holds that MECP2 is regulating it, then MECP2 mutants should have a greater amount of DNA in each of their neurons. So we developed a method where we could isolate individual cells uh, from animals that had these crosses, uh, and we took MECP2 and wild type moss as, and we uh, checked for neural karyotyping, obviously, and for cell cycle, and then did uh, quantitative PCR using primers that are built inside the ORF2. So we're measuring the total amount, in this case, of not the total DNA, but the amount of DNA that's contributed by this. So in fiberglass, there's really no difference. This is an inverse scale, so the the, the, number of, the lower the number of cycles, the more amount of DNA you have. But this is what happens in the neural epithelial cells, and these are in E13, E14 mice. So here you see a dramatic increase in the, the amount of DNA uh, in here. This is, again, fibroblast here, and this is neurons. And relative to wild types, the MECP knock, knockout in each of these, these are all individual cells, have more DNA content. And if we use a uh, control area, like a satellite or 5-SRNA, um, then there's no difference between these two and they're not different from fibroblasts. So the brain looks like it has, a mouse in any event, has more DNA in neurons as a function, we believe, of these insertions. But there's actually an increasing amount of mobile element sequence in the genome of all species, and humans have more of it than all other species. So what about humans? Well, the human line elements are, are, are quite variable. There are lots of them there. Hey, Kazazi and John Warren have done uh, most of the work on this. They, they've characterized uh, up, up through now, this is one study, but there's about 150 active elements that means that they can jump. And the way you characterize this, you clone out the element and put it into a cell and see whether or not it'll, it'll um, 
retrotranspose, and there are obviously some elements that from their study that are hotter than others. This, however, is not all time uh, clear with regard to uh, in neural cells or in, in what cells are doing. So these are artificial cancer cells. So here's been our approach to looking at this in humans. We've taken human hippocampus and human cerebellum, isolated uh, DNA, and developed a uh, multiplexing TACMAN approach to uh, quantify the amount of DNA that exists in tissue of uh, brain uh, versus liver and heart and skin from the same individual with the idea that the amount of DNA should be higher in your brain than it should be in the other tissue. And then look at this across people. And we used ORF2 as our, our primers we ORF2, which account for about 85% of all the human line elements, and we used a variety of control elements that we used as tags in this multiplexing. And in all cases, we see that hippocampus and cerebellum have a greater amount of DNA than do, uh, and here we have a ratio of the two controls uh, of the controls that we've used. We've done this now with a lot of patients uh, let's say, uh, brain tissue from uh, people that have died and dissected out different areas to see if there's any regionality. And this may be just a function of the poorness of the dissections, but we really can't get any kind of regional differences that exist in the brain yet, other than the fact that brain tissue is always greater than that of heart uh, and liver. And these are, again, matched from the same individuals as a paired comparison. To try now to get a, uh, a little bit feel of just how much quantitatively is there, we uh, look at the differences between the two and then, um, then add back in a spiking manner copies of lines into the um, tissue, into the sample, and then amplify it up. And what we see is that uh, between hippocampus and liver, there's about 1,000 to 10,000 copies. And if you figure, or uh, DNA content, we would say, is more. But if you think that each reaction has 80 picograms, and on average, each individual human cell has about 6.6 .6 picograms of DNA, and, and we usually use 12 cells per, per sample, then we're estimating that each neuron in the brain would have somewhere around 80 copies per cell uh, increase. Now, granted, this is just hand waving and uh, a little bit back of the shelf estimation, but what is consistent is that there's more uh, DNA content for these line elements in the brain than in, than in the others. So our, our view of this is that both in the fetus during early development, neurons, uh, and in adult, it turns out, uh, these line elements uh, are um, are silenced by SOX2 and ECB2. They're kept from being, there are lots of different mechanisms that are currently available that the body is using to keep these long elements silent. But during uh, commitment to neurons, SOX2 comes off and these cells will, for a brief period of time, about 18 hours, start transcribing. And because the nuclear membrane of the dividing cell is broken down, they can transport back into the cell where they can do DNA uh, insertions. Once the nuclear membrane reforms, they can't insert anymore. So there really is a very limited period of time in a neuron where this is possible. And that these insertions then add uh, some level of diversity on a single somatic cell uh, to the cells. So our, our, our conclusion is that the that neural progenitor cells can support line transposition and that line can impact neural gene expression with consequences for a cell, for an individual cell. And the brain, in fact, may be, may be mosaic, and that we may be more unique than we thought we were. Um, so in, in, in closing, I'd say that the adult brain can generate new neurons throughout life, and this is my dramatic brain plasticity part, so this is, a, to me, a surprise that the brain can actually make new neurons. Uh, but I think that's accepted now. Less well accepted is the idea that uh, line sequences are mobile in neurons, but we suppose uh, that this might be a mechanism for providing some uniqueness or individual diversity between neurons that needs, of course, a lot more exploration. But other than in closing, I'd just like to thank Peter, uh, and may your brain plasticity and neural diversity continue to work for you, and thank you and Patricia for your generous support and uh, of excellence in science. And these are my colleagues who've made this.
this work really possible. Thank you very much. Specifically, is that the dentate gyrus is a structure that's involved in what we're thinking of as pattern separation, the ability to discriminate between two closely related topics, two, two closely related objects. And what the new neurons do during that period of time is, is because they're hyperexcitable, they're actually transferring information about the relationship between those two novel objects that the older neurons are trying, trying to distinguish. So in the end of the day, to better distinguish between two events, it's good to know something about the relationship between them. Because if you don't know the relationship between the two objects that you're trying to discriminate, you'll see them as different in a later context as well. So the, the underlying theme is that knowing something about the difference between two things that you're trying to distinguish helps you distinguish between the two of them. Oh, we can pursue that, yeah. Yeah. That it just allows them to do it, but it doesn't hurt them. Yeah. Well, I, I, um, I think until, until we are successfully able to block all line elements from inserting and then looking what the consequence of that is, we have to be open to the idea that this is a neutral event that is just happening, but it, it's continuing to happen. The other thing that is happening is that the promoters that exist within the line elements, not even the active elements, but the other elements, are very active. And there's lots of line sequences that are bivalent or RNA sequences, non-coding sequences that are being made. So when you do deep sequencing for uh, small RNAs, the uh, line elements are actually a very large part of this. So what it may be is that that, that non-coding RNA is doing something very specific, and by virtue of opening up the RNA to allow that to happen, you, you periodically get these insertion events. That's, that's the weak part of the theory. Then we have to go figure out what the small RNAs are doing. But in terms of X inactivation now and other areas like that, small RNAs look like they're playing, from, from the line elements, look like they're, they're playing a role. But I, I, you know, I, uh, Yes. Uh, the, other, the other way is if it's somatic evolution, then that would mean that it is basically non-directed and just inserting. And whatever advantage it has is dependent upon the environmental influences for that cell at that place at that time. Well, do you know anything about the insert, are there favored insertion sites in the developing neuron? So we've already done about 100 um, identifications of where they've gone by this inverse PCR methodology. And more than 50% of them are neurons, but this was in vitro, so it may be the selection system that we're using might be that. So the, the real uh, studies are, are going on now doing deep sequencing for sequences, doing paradigm sequencing. So you, you, you have one probe that's inside the L1 and one's outside, so you can sequence in both directions and identify where they are. And so within the year, we'll know where they land. So we'll know if there are hot spots, if it's really random, or if, if, it's, if it's there. Yeah. Well, I might just make one comment in terms of transposons, looking at tens of thousands of sequences of, of other transposons, there's great deal of evidence that they are not randomly inserting in ways that modulate gene expression for at least some transposons, such as P elements. I just wondered if you looked at any other transposon families to see if this is like the tip of an iceberg. Yeah, so these are retrotransposons. I know you're, you're thinking in terms of your sophomore transposons. We've looked at some, we're beginning to look at outwards now. And uh, it's more complicated. Alloys are, are, are more complicated, but um, and I, I, I don't think we have enough data to say whether or not they're actively being inserted. What they 
uh, but they're, they're very active. <laughs> they're very active, but not certain about their insertion. So, yeah. But you could just do your same DNA quantitation assay and see which other families are increasing. Yes. Yeah. Then we, uh, we're thinking about that for hers and some of the other ones as well. Yeah. There's a question there. Uh, I'm not sure I heard that, but I, I'll answer it anyway. Is it an internal from wrong? Are you talking about... So, well, that's so many internal types. Okay, yeah. So our, our thinking, and this is really very speculative at this point, so we, what I'm saying now is beyond any data that we actually have. I don't think that these transposable elements are really involved in the diversity of making a decision between a cell as a granular cell or a parameter cell, but rather at a much... If, it, if, if at all, <laughs> it's at a much subtler level of gene expression, you know, of levels of expression of a receptor or a channel or something like that, not not so much with regard to whether or not the fate of the cell is switching with this. I, uh, you know, one of the things to remember in neurobiology is a good 40 to 50 percent of the cells that are born die normally during development. And we've historically thought of this as being a result of uh, the lack of some trophic factor supporting the cell, but it, there, there may be other reasons why the cells are dying also, other than just lack of trophic support. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cage. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our symposium. We thank you very much for being with us today to listen to some incredible science and some incredible scientists and to celebrate the 10th year of the Gruber Prizes, which honor groundbreaking achievement in science and human rights every year. Please join me in thanking once again our four distinguished speakers.